I'm so happy to be here today, so honored to have the chance to present uh, my project. It's called TILK. It stands for a tiny Linux compatible kernel. I'll be working uh, on it uh, since 2016, not full time all the time, but no, I, I spent a few years on it, working on it. So it's uh, what the project consists of. It's uh, not just a kernel, of course it's a kernel written in C and assembly, but the project um, has also a bootloader working both on UFI and uh, BIOS systems. Uh, but actually there are two bootloaders that share some common code. So it looks like exactly the same, but in reality there are two different implementations. Uh, also several test suites that I'll get to that uh, later uh, are part of the project, along with a CMake, build, uh, CMake based build system. Uh, build root uh, uh, like scripts for downloading and building third-party software. Uh, so those are the four main components of this project. It's partially compa compatible with Linux at binary level. Uh, I'll get to that uh, later, but just wanted to remark that it's a partial compatible. It's not like an attempt to rewrite Linux or anything like that. It's uniprocessor, but fully printable, which is uh, uh, right in the middle between uh, classic uh, Unix operating systems that were not preemptable, nothing like Uniprocessor, and modern full SMPs preemptable kernels like Linux. So this is right in the middle and allow me will allow me this choice to, to move to SMP eventually. But even if I don't, like if this project stays Uniprocessor, it can be made real time. So the fact it's fully preemptable is very important uh, from the beginning, you know, to not assume that it's safe to touch uh, data structures, everything can be preempted. So it's an educational project. I will continue to call it an educational project until it gets to the point that's usable for production uh, purposes. Uh, so I don't know if uh, the project will ever get there, but I really hope so. So I believe this project has more potential. Other than the few months at the beginning when I started just playing, you know, playing around, trying to learn what kernel development is, uh, what means to write a legacy bootloader and in protected 32-bit uh, mode, you know, other than that, I, after that at some point I started to get more ambitious and, and try to make something more. And um, the project runs only on x86 at the moment, but just, this is like just a um, convenient choice. It was the simpler solution for me at the beginning to start this way, I already knew uh, x86 assembly. Also, I wanted to run it on all my machines and maybe run on uh, fr uh, friends' machines. You know, you know, it's not just like uh, if you start with ARM, it will run just on, for example, Raspberry Pi. Um, I believe this is like a good first step. And then, and then of course, the, the the point of this project should be to be ported on other uh, architectures. In particular, ARM, Cortex R. Uh, Risk five uh, and so on. Uh, it's open source, of course. So uh, what Tilk is not definitely me. So as I said, not an attempt to replace Linux, not an attempt to be a desktop operating system, not an attempt to be a server operating system. Uh, it's not a real time OS, but it might become one in the future. I like this idea. Not sure what will become of this project. It also depends a lot of the interest in the community because uh, I've been working a lot on this project but you know realistically I cannot spend like the rest of my life working on it full time and uh, so it depends of a little bit on the community what uh, what is more interesting so but this is one realistic chance also the project cannot run on no MMU machines but probably will in the future already has some no MMU features but it's not complete so for the moment it's not there yet but it's part of the plans. As I said, it's not ready for production use. It lacks uh, several features, storage, networking. So that's why it's still educational. It's a toy, maybe a nice toy. <laughs> why the binary compatibility with Linux? Uh, well, first of all, it's so cool to be able to test the same bits on both the operating systems. Like it excited me this idea from the beginning. Um, uh, also, uh, it, it can be useful for testing, for uh, you know robustness, because uh, when you write software, if you if you write both the parts of an interface, you're somehow maybe biased a little bit because you know what can be done, what can, what can't. So if you run instead software that has never been written for this operating system, 
uh, it's a good thing be able to make it run. Of course, it didn't run a lot of software on the first time, but I made it work, you know, after some debugging, so effort. Also, I didn't want to design a new Cisco interface from scratch, uh, you know, mm, mm, it didn't make much sense to me. Like, unless uh, either, either we design something completely new, innovative, something super fancy, or the other choice was to, to stuck with uh, a compatibility with a known operating system like Linux, uh, because it's a more practical choice. What's the point of making something that's 90% compatible with Linux, but not exactly, like maybe a little bit polished, but, and then what? It's like, it's a non-trivial uh, advantage of being binary compatible, at least to me. I, I do performance measurements, I run the same tests both on Linux and Tilk, so I can do some real comparison. And didn't want to implement a custom libc, uh, and also I wanted to use um, the pre-built toolchains, since I discovered toolchains.botlin.com, like I was super happy, and become like, uh, this whole thing, the toolchain, the, the Cisco interface, it, it became a good idea for me to uh, to use already stuff made for Linux. Tools, tool chains, everything. Uh, and I also hope that this choice will somehow uh, increase the interest uh, of the community for this project. Maybe because it's more e easy to port pro uh, pre existing software to it. It will require some effort, but maybe not so much. So, uh, as you can imagine, for a project like that, uh, what what can be the typical goals, like mim uh, minimal memory footprint, ultra low latency, deterministic behavior, extra robustness. Uh, let me point out here that Teal currently can run smoothly with eight megabytes of RAM in a VM, but with some special configuration uh, by dropping some uh, modules at compile time that are not essential. So it can be shrink down to three megabytes in total. Like this includes the initial RAM disk with a, a busy box, so it's like depends on what you put on the initial run disk, but overall, like with uh, three megabytes of RAM, it, it can run. So it's like has potential to very small scale applications. And uh, it's very important for me the robustness. I don't claim this Tilk is uh, so robust uh, like Linux or other, you know, mainstream world class operating systems, but it's one of my goals. Like uh, I, I have a plenty of tests, uh, still not enough. I have 69% uh, of code coverage. Uh, but the idea is because it's so simple, be able to reach like a 100% like coverage, maybe a 100% branch coverage and be like something super reliable that you can, uh, you know, trust uh, your, your life uh, on it. Like it's not today, but this is like my, my goal because it's, it's small, you can, uh, here things can be done that in Linux cannot be done because of the legacy stuff that Linux has to support. It's, uh, so it's big, it's complicated, it are different things. Here we can cut corners and not support this, not support that, and support whatever is just convenient. Uh, and leave, leave out the rest. And also can have, of course, custom interfaces. And just for the simple stuff, it makes sense to be 100% compatible. Um, and it's very important to, to work on real hardware. So even if it uh, uses some legacy stuff, legacy hardware components, it works on modern machines. It's 32 bit, but yeah, it works on this machine, this Dell XPS, it works smoothly on it. And I bet it will work on most of other 2022 laptops. Another thing that, that I wanted to, to mention before, before proceeding further is um, non-technical aspect of this project. I really care about the developer experience. Um, this is, this came from my personal frustration towards some, some projects, my, my personal experience that, uh, you know, oh, how cool is this project? Then I download it and it starts. Oh, I don't know, don't have the right packages. I have to install them. I don't know the list or maybe there is a file with a list, but the list is incomplete. So I have to figure out what to do. Uh, I sometimes I have to spend hours trying to build something. Not, I'm not talking about the best of the best, the project, it's not Linux case, Linux is very, very well done. But many projects, you know, I observed, like there are other projects like mine, small operating systems are very complicated, you know, to build. And I don't like that. So this is like part of the choice of being competitive with Linux and using the Linux toolchains are part of this whole plan to make like super easy to build and, and test this project. Even if you know nothing about current development, just uh, able to, you know, do simply stuff with the console, I, I'd, be, I'd like to everyone to be able to at least compile it and 
test it and maybe some imagine some students just some students just go there and write a print k why not you don't have to understand everything and to be a super you know senior engineer in order to just build a project and test it so uh, for senior engineers of course it's a way to save time like in five minutes you you run a script and that's it so uh that's the hardest part now a live demo because i believe a demo is more than more, more than a thousand words uh, I was already too long with the, the initial part, um, so uh, let me let me show you something here. So how it starts? I don't know if is the text is the font good enough? The size? Okay. So once you uh, loan the the tilts repo, you're supposed to run this script here. That will uh, that will automatically uh, check all the packages that you have to uh, that are required on the system to be installed, and and then generate eventually a command like sudo apt install uh, if, and run it for you to to install those packages automatically if none of them are required. Now it, it won't, but sudo. And this doesn't work just for Debian, Ubuntu, or those uh, distros, but it works for other distros as well, like Fedora, OpenSUSE, Arc Linux, and all their clones. Uh, so if necessary, I will plan to eventually extend this list with other distros as well. It has to be super simple. After this step, the, this tool uh, downloads the pre-built tool chain um, and other packages, like BusyBox, the bare minimum. There are other packages. That you can see if you if you run with dash h or dash dash help, as you can see uh, all, all of them uh, and all of them are installed. Also, there is a cache. In this case, I'll show you how simple it is to just install the tree command. That's it. So now you can run, and it's installed. So now then you're supposed to run a, the C make wrapper script, or you can run just run make, which is just a wrapper for our uh, CMake wrapper script. So it's so convenient to just run make, but in reality it's CMake. Um, now, okay, we, we're, uh, we're done here. We have, to, we have to enable this package because uh, having Intel chain doesn't mean it's enabled. It will just rebuild uh, uh, the image. So it's very important for me to, to have an incremental build that works very well. So CMake helped me a lot. So uh, I launched the script for, for running it. Now the resolution is low. Uh, I will use just for the bootloader this feature here to increment the, uh, the size. Uh, you, can, you can choose a, a different kernel file if you want. You can put m more than one kernel file in the, in the boot partition. You can set the video mode, like in this case, I would say 10. You can edit the uh, command line. Like I want a uh, 3D device, so uh, now I'll just want to reset this to default, and then boot, and voila, like that's it. Uh, it boots super fast, as you can see. It detects some stuff. Mostly, it does uh, enumeration PCI devices, uh, initialization, general initialization of the kernel, in, um, uh, enumeration of PCI devices, and full enablement of ACPI. Like the whole five steps are enabled, so it like it, the machine is in fully ACPI state. This was uh, one of the maybe more challenging stuff because I have to implement the whole OSL layer to make ACPI CI work, but it does. And other than that, I don't have a lot of uh, ACPI drivers, but uh, I can, you know, for example, on some machines like this one, if you have the battery object as a control method implemented, you'll see here on the top uh, next, uh, before the date, you'll see the percent of remaining battery. And on this machine works, for example. Uh, then, you know, the experience is, uh, what to say, similar to any Unix uh, operating system. It's like, of course, it's limited, but you can, you can use pipes, you can, you can see BusyBox all the siblings. With three, you can just uh, dump, uh, uh, you, you can see the whole file system. Uh, here in my CSFS, I have this ACPI directory, which is very useful for developers mainly to see the whole ACPI namespaces, namespace with uh, these extra attributes like type and value and the list of methods where it's available. 
uh, it's very useful for me when I move to another machine, see oh, what is available. Instead of writing a ton of, uh, you know, print case statements and reboot the machine, I see everything here. Uh, and in CCFS also there is the PCI devices, just info, I don't have some drivers, but I have the infrastructure necessary for PCI drivers and things like that. And then I have config that are compile time, you know, options. CCFS supports all, all, also runtime editing of uh, options, but I try to keep that to the minimum. The moment there is no CCFS uh, options that are editable runtime, because this is not an operating system like Linux, uh, like FreeBSD, that it's meant to be booted on a machine and then stay there for um, a long time and then have users customize it. Uh, like, no, like there is an option, for example, to not make the cursor blinking. It can be made absolutely at runtime, but it's not for this. This is like, uh, anyway, you don't even need a console for this. The console and everything else is just for developers. The rest is, if in the future becomes production ready, you'll just have a serial console or something like the bare minimum. So all these options doesn't make sense to have a lot of complexity to, to configure at runtime. Um, so, still, I have plenty of features that are implemented for for myself, for other developers, and because um, it's cool. Like part of my effort was also to uh, to show the stability of project through ways that are you know a little bit indirect. Like for example, VI works, and I was pretty happy with this result. This is like a minimal VI implementation of um, a busy box. Uh, people say, uh, people say to me, oh, but this is not the whole thing, it's not Vim, you don't have syntax highlighting, you don't have this and that. Uh, and I say, well, this is like a small printing system for embedded. No, yeah, but it will be so cool. All right. So <laughs> I spent some extra time <laughs> and I make Vim to work. Let me show you. First, I have to, to put it in the image. I'll put another thing as well. Now you'll see the boot will be uh, slower because it will have to load plenty of stuff in memory. But it's exactly the same thing. Here we are. And after maybe two months of work, I don't know, I implemented a ton of stuff and you see Vim here. We say tax highlighting and megabytes of plugins and completely useless stuff. Completely useless. But hey, it worked. And it required fixing a ton of stuff, you know. Uh, also implemented uh, yet as part of a way to attract contributors and maybe people that are not hardcore kernel developers that but may want to, you know, enter the community and trying to create. Uh, at the moment it's not existing, like I have people that made one line change, but I, I really wish to have some contributors. So I say, well, let's let's implement the, <laughs> the frame buffer interface. So uh, I already have the frame buffer console, while well, not support exactly the same interface. If you see here in dev, you know, uh, you can see FB0 it has exactly the same interface as Linux, the newer one, the newest one. So I implemented a, a library that uh, just draws stuff on the screen because it's cool. And then I, I think that was more useful for me. I implemented Tetris <laughs> because it was so cool, like uh, even my wife playing on it. Uh, and it really increased the stability of this kernel. I have a, a smaller machine and I played a lot of Tetris at the beginning, this 2018, like this has been working since 2018. And um, it allowed me to, you know, catch some race conditions and things like that. And people get said, well, well, this is cool, but you know that there is a frame buffer, uh, there is a um, uh, Doom port for the Linux frame buffer. I mean, why don't you make this run? That will be really impressive. Okay, guys, le let me run down of my uh, embedded system, like... <laughs> because why not? <laughs> Well, and, and I realized that actually my time management uh, wasn't fine. I was trying to get some corners. I could turn too many corners. Uh, so I have to increase the, um, the granularity of the, of the time. Anyway, I have made some very uh, useful changes to make this work. If you have the commercial word file for the one, you can put it. But I didn't want to show this in presentation. But if you put it in the right directory, it will run the real commercial room. Not, it's just a map that's different. 
So, yeah, I hope people are happy. <laughs> uh, other things, as you can see here, the virtual console, but this is, this is not so impressive. But hey, you have it. And um, then another thing, I wanted to show what helped me uh, support Vim and uh, uh, more complex applications. Um, let me show you here. I have by default a serial console. Uh, by default, on the first serial, serial port, you can it automatically tilt runs a, a, a console. So here you can do exactly the, the same stuff. Okay, but um, what is cool that uh, you can you can use it for 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 tracing. So uh, before getting to the tracing, le let me show you here. I implemented a debug panel, um, which is uh, before uh, before um, the time of the um, uh, uh, the CFS. Implemented this to to see some useful uh, things on on the kernel when I put it on hardware machine because. I didn't have GDB. If I put he, put here uh, Tilk, I don't have you know GDB, and uh, so I did some you know useful stuff here for me. And uh, then I realized that I can extend it and implement a, a Cisco tracer. Actually, it was mandatory for Vim uh, because I didn't know Vim didn't work properly because I didn't know all the escape sequences that used. Like I've implemented like fifty or sixty percent of the. Of the, the maybe seventy percent of the the escape uh, sequences that Linux support, but it wasn't enough to run Vim. It was a disaster. It ran on the serial console, but not on the video console because my console didn't support all that. So what I did, okay, let me implement a Cisco tracer. Then you can run like this. You can see the list of uh, processes. You can select a PID. It will trace the PID with all of uh, its children. Then we go here, and then whatever you write, it's like it, it, it traces and 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 um, how to say the reference uh, pointers and show strings and everything. It doesn't uh, work 100% of the cases. It's not that that work. I don't have the metadata, all the functions for every struct, every type, but it's a fair amount of things that I needed. So it's uh, modular. I can add more more stuff. For example, if you have a stat buff here, stat buff is just a pointer because I have an added code to render it. The buffer just uh, uh, writes the raw data in in the ring buffer when you when you trace, and then and then there is the, this other component when you run the tracer here to to extract the data from the ring buffer and see what's going on. So I needed it for for Vim. So now if you if you open Vim, you see how many stuff is uh, how much stuff is going on, and. Uh, it starts to be uh, unreasonable, so that's why I, um, I enable the filter. So you can say I just want to, to trace uh, right and write V. So that's what happens. So that's why that's how I uh, made him to work. Uh, it, it it was non trivial, and I realized that the consoles are more complicated than I uh, wish them to be. Anyway, this works. Uh, now I wanted to to, uh, to spend a few words about testing Tilk. Uh, I have four types of tests. The, the first one, the, my preferred types of testing is unit tests. I use the Google test uh, framework. So it's super simple. You can run it like that. It's super fast, like a plenty of tests. Um, then, of course, not everything can be tested this way. Uh, then I have um, kernel self tests and uh, system tests which uh, uh, the kernel cell tests are run inside the kernel. Uh, and uh, they're mostly for things like, uh, as you can see here, the full list, for things like uh, condition variables, semaphores, uh, you know, mutexes, uh, locking primitives, synchronization primitives mostly. And then you have all the rest that are uh, runnable with uh, syscalls. And I can run them both from a runner in Python, and then the runner um, runs still with uh, Redirection to the serial port and reads line by line the, the serial port and detects if something goes wrong. And uh, I run this way the tests in the cloud. Um, but I can also I can also run the system tests on on the machine itself. It's very useful when I just reboot the machine. I can, you know, uh, do something like this. So I have a runner from outside and a runner inside just for the um, uh, for the system tests. You can run self tests, but not with a runner. You can run them individually, uh, because if one uh, self tests crash, 
crashes, the whole kernel is gone. While if the system test crashes, nothing will happen. Just the child will die. Hopefully, I mean, <laughs> and uh, that's it. And I wasn't satisfied with that. Like it was good, but it was not enough uh, because there are still some code paths that are not exposed. Which code paths? For example, if you run this in the cloud, okay, you you have. Uh, let me show you here. Uh, I run this. All these builds, like run all the tests, like with three different compilers. I support also the system compiler with uh, an external libc. Even if I use the uh, pre-built to change, it's like just uh, the default thing. I support other scenarios. Anyway, um, this was not enough because there are some parts, like for example, what you do when you want to test like um, the actual RQs that come from PS2. Like you have PS2 input. It's not the same thing. One thing is the serial console, the other is the PS2. Uh, so also the frame buffer console. I mean, it's not the most important thing that needs a hundred percent coverage. Like my locator has almost a hundred percent coverage, but still, I wanted to to increase the coverage and um, do automatic testing. For me, it's very important to have automatic testing. So what I did, I introduced a weird kind of test. I call them um, interactive tests. Correct me if 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 you came up with a better name. Just tell me. Uh, I call them interactive. So what happens is that um, to simulate a hundred percent what happens if you if you use Tilk, I boot it in the graphic mode, okay, and then because I know exactly the font, I boot it with uh, the fixed resolution eight hundred by six hundred. I know exactly the font. I wrote a tool that transforms back like an OCR, but it's a perfectly deterministic OCR. Transforms back the image to text. And then I check this text against some uh, tests and find some strings to be sure that it works. And I use uh, QEBUS monitor with uh, send key. Actually, there is a better interface, but I use this one. Now I'm running a simple test. You can run Vim this way because I thought how you can test like all the code paths that Vim exposes. Well, this way. As you can see, this is like an image. I have the image here. Not all the images are printed on the screen to avoid spam. But you can see here the commands like send L, send S, you know, send space, uh, and so on. And here are the images that actually are deleted, but I made a patch to, to make them keep. It was tricky to implement because you have to do more than one screenshot, uh, be sure that uh, nothing on the screen changes and so on. But it was very useful to me because I, I can test more code paths that I could with the other cases. So all the four type of tests are needed. And actually, for a real production test, I'll have to write stress tests and a lot of stuff. But I first like to get a hundred percent coverage, and don't have quite the time and the resources to to do all of this by myself. Um, so I believe this is uh, good enough for the live demo. Uh, there are too many, too, too many things to show, but I, I, I believe it's uh, it's worth moving on. So now it's uh, I believe it's it's work uh, it's worth. Talking about some funny stories and interesting challenges. Uh, so let's start with uh, the first one. My latest bug. Like, there couldn't be something better than just working with this presentation, working this material, then I found a bug. Like that. Uh, and this bug has two, uh, two char fix. I couldn't find a bug with one char fix, but it's like closer. <laughs> I recently introduced a test for a feature that I have for a long time, but I didn't have a proper test. This test does the following things. It estimates the amount of committed memory that can be used in an empiric well, way, uh, allocates and commit more than half of that memory, then calls fork, then the child tries to commit all of that memory and expects the child to be killed by the kernel. Of course, I know the whole story that uh, the out of memory killer, like I know the whole heuristics, like uh, I don't know everything, but I know it's a complicated task, but this is not Linux, it's like a small embedded system, that's what I wanted, like for the moment, that's it, like if you try to commit memory, the process uh, that it's unlucky that tries to, to do that gets killed, and for the moment it's uh, either zero over commit or infinite over commit, like I don't have all the, the stuff in between, I can do it, but it's not right now, anyway, uh, that's the behavior I expect. So it's good, to, even if the behavior is not definitive one, it's good to have for every behavior you expect to have a test. So I found that it fell some real hardware machines. And I always, you know, a bit 
you know, why? Come on, it works perfectly on VMs. Why it has to work on hardware machines? Now I have to do some hard debugging. No, I realized that it fails on VMs too. Why? Uh, uh, just the VMs use uh, less memory. So if you use more memory, create a bigger VM, it will fail. It, that's weird, and I had to debug it. Like it was a few days before departing from here. And as you can see a screenshot, it's uh, doing fine. Like everything's fine. It allocates uh, 262 megabytes of memory, while uh, 501 is usable. And then it forks, and the child is able to, to commit all of that. And this is like, more than half, uh, more, um, uh, I'm sorry, more than all the usable memory. This is incredible, it shouldn't be possible. We don't have swap, we don't have anything like here, so it's not possible. And then it fails with uh, kernel panic, and that's weird, uh, because uh, we're trying to free an object that hasn't been allocated on the heap. So I started debugging my copy and write logic, and I realized that, uh, well, we get here, which is a check where you have um, uh, the, the physical page have uh, a ref count of one. It's the case where you have a, a process, then you fork, you have a child, then the parent dies, and uh, the child now can own directly the page instead of you know copying it. Uh, so this shouldn't be the case. It, it should never happen like in this case. And I observed this after a few megabytes in the child. So we commit, and then we fork, and after a few megabytes in the child, that's we end here. I used some debugging techniques anyway. Then I realized I had asserts disabled. I enabled them and observed, yep, it's the zero page. We are trying to free the zero page. I believe in the Linux kernel is called empty zero page or zero empty page. Like it took me one hour, one day to, to find it. <laughs> anyway, so I, I continued to investigate to the limit case and I realized if you alloc try to um, allocate you know, and commit 255 megabytes, it works. More of that, it doesn't. Can anybody guess why? Here is a hint. Where is the bug? <laughs> Steven? <laughs> okay. I'm assuming it's a clock by wire. No. 16-bit oh. ref <laughs> With a 16 bit ref count, what happens is that it, uh, the, the, um, the ref count wraps around after uh, 64k pages. That means that uh, we cannot support more than 256 uh, megabytes uh, of uncommitted memory. Like for me, it was super reasonable at the time to not use more than uh, 16 bits for ref count because it's a small scale, uh, small, uh, small scale uh, operating system. You have like a uh, hundred tasks at most. You you, do, you don't share so many pages. Like it's pointless. I, I mean, like, and these arguments are still true, except one case, the zero page. <laughs> because if you have uh, uh, hundreds of megabytes of memory, the zero page has a very high ref count and we don't, this, don't want this to, to wrap around. Uh, so the fix was trivial. I use U32 and that was the fix. Now, um, um, stuff that's more interest, I I'll, I'll try to, to make it in time. Making the frame buffer console fast. And I I'll show you later what I mean with fast. But uh, first of all, why implementing a frame buffer console? Like, uh, as I said, I didn't want to support Doom, Vim. Uh, I didn't want to have even a frame buffer console because why? Well, Textbot is like was died was dead even five years ago, and it's just an x86 thing. So actually, I want to able to test and run my operating system even on Raspberry Pi or on modern Purify machines. I had no choice. I had to implement a frame buffer console. And why speed matters so much? You know, the the guys uh, part of you that are yeah, more expert, you know that just mark uh, the solution is to just mark the pages as right combining, and that's it. You'll be done. That's it. Uh, that's the problem, that's the solution, and we are done. Yep, but I didn't know about right combining at the time. <laughs> I, I spent like two months, at least I discovered it. So I implemented a series of optimizations. I cannot tell you all about this, the whole story. It's a mess. I don't remember even myself, but what I, what I, I'll say a few things about this, about my experiments. So the PF, PSF thoughts are very simple. You have a bit field. And you just, you know, for each bit you have to use either the background color or the foreground color. It's trivial. Um, and the simplest draw function, as you can see, you just need a draw pixel and a draw chart function that just goes over and draws each, each pixel and checks uh, which color to use. And it was uh, insanely slow. But it was kind of usable on slow resolutions, but in particular this laptop 
has a retina display, so uh, 3200 by 1800. It took 2.5 milliseconds per char. You know, it, it, it's like you you have you can see the screen redrawing. It was insane. Why I run Linux here, the frame buffer console, it flies. Like it cannot be like my code is incredibly stupid. I didn't know that by combining. Then I started to do some naive optimizations like this because I was desperate. It didn't work on modern machines, kept some impact on older 32-bit machine, but it's still ridiculous. Then I made a lot of other stupid things like a shadow buffer. Nothing was so good. This was one thing that was interesting. Pre-rendering the glyphs. This this intuition. Pre-rendering the glyphs, rendering the glyphs uh, pixel by pixel is too slow. So what about pre-rendering? This was an intuition that has some interesting outcomes. And uh, the problem is that it's unfeasible. Even with small phones, it's totally crazy with bigger phones. Like, it's, uh, it's a disaster. But what about pre-rendering just the scan lines? Again, a term that I used, but maybe it's not the right one. Uh, it will take just two megabytes. I'll show you what are the scan lines. These things. Like, uh, it can work o o also on um, bigger, um, bigger phones. If you if you render all the possible this for it doesn't matter the fonts because there are just two to the power of eight uh, possible scan lines you render them for all the possible colors and you spend two megabytes of memory it's a lot but for a laptop like this if you have Retina display maybe it's worth it that's what was I uh, what I thought the pre-render code is trivial just for nested loops and then the problem number two it's too slow to copy for bytes at a time even if you have everything pre-rendered how you copy to the frame buffer. I use rep moves, which is too slow. Then somehow I read something, I don't know, I thought about something like a few mem copy. Uh, um, and the cost of that could be, uh, the cost of saving and restoring reg registers can be offset when you, when you, when you scroll. Because uh, if, you, if you don't scroll, uh, you just write, uh, you press one, one char, it doesn't need. But for the whole scrolling, it's too slow. Uh, so implementing the functions, you can see you have a function here that just copies 250 bits bit in the fastest way possible. If possible, with just two instructions. Here we have some checks. I do some hot patching tricks. And as you can see, if you have AVX2, you'll use the, the version uh, above. Otherwise, uh, this one with 128 bi uh, bits. And then the latest one, if you have just 64 bits uh, registers. And actually, it was not bad, like almost a six times faster on, on this machine, two times faster on the older one, and almost seven times faster on the native resolution because we don't have the overhead of scaling. And still, it wasn't fast enough. It's, it was significantly faster, close, you know, to the 8x limit, but still, it's like we're talking about almost 500 microseconds per char, still noticeable. Like Linux was way faster. And then I was stuck like here for like maybe a few weeks, two weeks. Then it's called recombining. As you know, like recombining, you, you, uh, you want, once you mark the pages as right combining, uh, the hardware writes, uh, the data, uh, in a temporary buffer, then releases in burst. And, uh, it's great for frame buffers. So what happened that I got like without any other effort, 33 times, uh, improvement to just 12 uh, and a half percent improvement on the top of that with my optimization so as you can see my optimizations are pointless uh, after using uh, right combining uh, on the older 32-bit machine with smaller fpu regs my optimization has no effect and like the the whole right combining is it's like my optimization alone like uh, uh, as you can see here my optimization alone uh, was uh, 1.9 times faster, so here, like red combining is a little bit faster than just my optimization, but on the top of that, my optimization gives nothing more. But it's interesting that on the native resolution, when we don't have overhead of rescaling, like it's a hundred times faster with right combining, and my optimization gives a 2.6 times faster on the top of that. So it's like it's something. It's still not uh, super critical, but 2.6 times on the top of like a hundred times is well, we went from 2,500 microseconds to just 9.55. And it was super interesting now, finally, to compare in a fair way to the performance of the Tilk console with the performance of the Linux console. And like the best is 9.55 microseconds and Linux 56.4. I have no idea why is that. Like it's almost six times faster. 
guys, I don't know. Like, I believe that Linux doesn't have this optimization to pre-rendering stuff. It's like, doesn't feel like uh, a thing that will exist in Linux. I don't know. Uh, but even without that, with just my fail safe code, just, just uh, those pixels, uh, it, it's like 25 microseconds compared to the 56 in Linux. And I don't know why. It's like an open question for you guys to, I don't know, like I didn't have time to investigate. It's a curious thing. Why? Maybe nobody cares because it, even 56 is super fast, fast enough. Just it was a curious thing. Why is that? I don't know. This is like the benchmark code. You just write some le letters on the screen and forces uh, the scrolling to, to happen. And um, I guess I don't have time for much of rest, but you can download the presentation and ch check out, uh, you know, my story about uh, how I tried to, to make uh, Limmuzzle's applications to work. And I wanted to cheat because uh, they required uh, the TLS support, so it meant implementing a separate area. I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I tried to cheat uh, by returning NOCs, by returning zero, by returning zero and setting uh, a descriptor number. And here it's, uh, you know, very simple, just the steps of debugging. And you'll see that uh, I was uh, punished and I couldn't cheat. Uh, so often we cannot cheat, so I have to implement the whole set rate area and then additional stuff for ref counting of, um, of GDT entries. And then another case, uh, I, I won't go uh, over time, just wanted to say that uh, this uh, case where I have to implement this ACPI OS weight semaphore and uh, I didn't want to cheat because I don't know what ACPI does, uh, uh, God forbid, like it, it wanted an implementation of semaphore that supports uh, weight uh, and signal with uh, N units, not just one, like traditional semaphores. I spent some time implementing this fancy semaphore. I didn't want to do it, but I did because that's what ACPI CA wanted. And then how did you guys like how Linux handled this problem? I was too curious that after my implementation get now I can read it because you know we have different licenses and I cannot read too much Linux source code. Well it didn't. <laughs> like it didn't. Like this is like a piece of the code on Elixir. And uh sometimes cheating works. Like <laughs> so thank you very much. If you have time for a question, uh, otherwise. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Air metal. Yes, it worked. Do you want to see it? Yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, but I, I. Not sure. I, I have to disconnect this. It's okay. Like I can, I can run it. Yeah, he told me he doesn't have HDMI implemented, so he can't do it. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I don't have HDMI, but uh, I, I have a flash here, so we can actually reboot the machine. Turn it around so we can see. See, well, one second, one second. <laughs> I have to, to press uh, uh, F12 <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> hoping to not miss it. Yeah. So, here we are. Legacy or UEFI, what do you prefer? Well, you got one Doom. <laughs> Sorry? Legacy, yeah. That's Legacy. It took a bit to, to switch the screen resolution. Then you choose the video mode. Do you want the native? If you want the native, here we are. The native is number seven. <laughs> this is the commercial one. Thank you. you uh, so you said that you had to do GD, GDT entry ref counting for TLS, but um, if for 32-bit, I think you can just switch the entries on context switch, right? So I was curious what you meant by ref counting the GDT entries. Okay, uh, so uh, for separate area, they, they use uh, really GDT. I wanted to use LDT, but that that was the code the code does. So okay, GDT is a global thing. Okay, I, I create an entry. You have a max for three entries uh, per uh, process 
Why? Because Linux does that. It's, it's not, not documented anywhere, but in Linux is three entries, so in Tilk will be three entries. Then uh, you, you call this uh, special wrapper separate area that doesn't have a glibc wrapper anyway, that you request, you know, for TLS request uh, an entry. This way you can use actual segmentation. Um, and then what's the problem? A GT entry has, uh, it, it gets created for, for your process, and that's fine. Then you do fork. What happens? That the child now has to access the same thing in the same way. But it's different memory, but you use copying right, so the addresses has to be the same. Now, the, what happens? Like, you need a ref count, because otherwise, if without a ref count, like I had at the beginning, like I had for a few months until I discovered this bug, the, the parent dies, and then it frees the, the, the GTD entries. And then the child tries to do something with TLS, and then it crashes. Hmm. <laughs> so you have to, to keep the ref count every time. You know, every time you fork, you have to keep ref count in this global table. I was wondering what's the memory footprint or the minimal memory footprint of Tilk? Yes, it, it, uh, I can, I can tell you here it's, um, the kernel with like this full package is just, uh, one megabyte and 280 kilobytes, but it's like the full thing. If you, if you drop it, I have a tiny kernel option. It can be just a few hundred uh, kilobytes. I don't remember exactly. The point is that like this, it can run on eight megabytes machine on a VM, maybe even on six megabytes. And if you cut down like fancy things like the frame buffer console and other not uh, super important stuff, you can get up to three megabytes, including uh, 400 kilobytes for Bitbox. So with three megabytes, you can run decently with a zero console and everything. I can probably squeeze it down a little bit, but it makes sense to have a no MMU support. I'd like to make this. Actually, I plan to make a x86 no MMU, which is super pointless, but it's good from the <laughs> research point of view. Because once you made it a no MMU, it doesn't matter if it's x86 or ARM, it will be like I have to port it to ARM and then I have to be able to run on Cortex R processors. So, like three megabytes, two megabytes of RAM, I believe it's reasonable. I can won't go much more than that. Uh, we got a question from the stream because there are some people watching online. So yeah. I'm, I'm providing the question for you. Um, is it possible to run this on 32 bit systems like the Intel Quark, uh, Quark SOC? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Is it possible to run what? On 32 bit systems like the Intel Quark SOC. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was an idea. I don't have the hardware, I, so I didn't try it. But yeah, the problem is that hardware is dead. That's the real problem because. Uh, if the hardware is dead, I don't have a easy way to buy it, but even if I buy it, like, it's dead. But, yeah, theoretically, yes. Like, this one, one of the things, what if, like, I wish to have, you know, an embedded 32-bit processor, but all the projects are, are dead at the moment. Intel don't, um, don't want to invest uh, in this direction. Sure, ARM and RISC-V are, are better options, but it should work. Yeah, it should work, absolutely. Should. Kevin, okay, test it. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking about your Vim uh, debugging stories, uh, and I was wondering if you had the ptrace support, so you can just use strace for tracing syscalls. No, I don't have uh, the Linux interface for. Yeah, I don't have ptrace at all. Okay. One of the things that uh, actually my friend Steven told me, oh, but the don't implement ptrace is too complicated. <laughs> no, so I have like a trivial uh, mine interface. Actually, okay, let, 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 let me be uh, here 100% uh, frank. The debug panel and the tracer running kernel. That's why these are just developer tools and exposing a whole interface to user space will be complicated. It, the kernel will be, maybe it's better to do it, but it overall increased the complexity. So at the moment, it's, everything is done in kernel. This, like the tracer, the debug panel, it runs in kernel. You have just the user process that it do a syscall, and then you see this in kernel. And you're supposed to like not use it at all for production systems. And uh, yeah, so the tracer, it's no, you don't have to trace. I don't, I don't know if I will implement. But do you imagine I already spent some effort implementing the signals? If I, if I have to be a hundred percent competitive with Linux, like it's better to pick up Linux. Linux is great at what it does. Like I want to cut corners and cheat whatever I can to implement something super small, like 
I have a cut down signal support because the full support of signals is very complicated. This is like one of the other things. Maybe, I don't know. If it's not too complicated, maybe I will support it. But what's the point of debugging with GDP on a machine that it's not a desktop machine? Like, you're supposed to test everything like in a different way for embedded systems. I don't know. Maybe this, this project will evolve in a different direction. For example, for, to run, uh, applications in micro microservices in the cloud i don't know if it goes that direction then sure i will uh go in that direction. i don't know like i prefer the embedded direction but we'll see it depends a lot on the community as well uh, as you can see here the battery i'm sorry it's very small but you can see here the battery <laughs> yeah the battery the percentage of the battery yeah sorry couldn't do it over here. yes um, so I, I, I wonder about you calling Linux, which is of course right. About drivers and driver cores, do you also uh, like PCI, for example? Is the PCI core very similar to Linux? So you bought drivers, or did you do something on your own there? There is, there is a PCI enumeration. It supports PCI Express as well, and that's it. Like you can write a PCI driver, but that's it. Like it's um, just the beginning. So, no, I don't support the Linux interface for drivers. I don't have plenty of ACPI drivers myself. Like, no, sorry, this aspect is, I didn't get there yet. I, I believe when I implement the first network driver, I want to implement some network drivers. Then I, I sort of start to implement infrastructure, but I don't think it's a good idea to try to support the Linux drivers. It has to be something more limited. I don't know, people mentioned BSD drivers. I don't know, like, I accept suggestions and feedbacks for you guys. Uh, at the moment, it's not there. Just enumeration. You can see everything, but it's limited. Uh, just follow up on that. Do you have any driver model yet? Uh, almost no. It's very limited. Okay. When you walk through uh, the ACPI namespace, ah, here by the way, I can I can show you. But sh show is a <laughs> it's a big word. I can show you with three the whole ACPI tree of this machine, which is super big. When when the tilt boots. Uh, what happens is that um, it, uh, it has some callbacks, a very naive interface with callbacks, and then then you can you can plug your callbacks like I did with the driver, the battery driver, and then you can you know you can detect you say for this uh, ID of this uh, class device I support uh, I support, but it's very very limited. I have to work a lot on it. Actually, I, I mean it's like a lot of work to be done. So yeah, it's very basic. Yes. What kind of file systems do you support? Ah, good. Who is asking? Sorry. Yeah. What, what kind uh, of file very systems? Very good question. So um, there is a initram disk which is a FAT32, but it's read only. It's like it's convenient because you put a flash drive in any machine and you'll be able to put files. And uh, also Uf UFI uses uh, FAT32. It was very convenient. And then you have a custom file system for dev. And uh, the main file system, the root one, is uh, RAMFS. So it supports uh, most of the Unix uh, things, like uh, even file holes. You know that you can skip. You know I have uh, holes in files without having the data. So things it supported, symlinks, but uh, that's it. Like no support for X2. I wanted to support it, but I'm not there yet. You have to implement a disk driver first, and then implement actually, you know, paging. Uh, sorry, page cache things like that, and then support X2. Yeah, sure. It's a to the list. Okay. Thank you.